Good morning, church. I'm so glad to be here with you guys today. And, and honestly, it's, it's such a great opportunity for me to, to be with you guys and to, to share the word with you. Uh, definitely want to thank the pastors for this opportunity um, and for believing in me. Today, I want to talk to you about something that's very near and dear to my heart. I want to talk to you about a season of waiting. Right now, church, my wife and I are in a season of waiting, not expecting, waiting. There's a difference. We're in between things. We're coming up on three years of marriage, the best three years of my life, but we're waiting for kids. We want to have more to provide more. I've told her in the past that I've already realized at this part of my life, I want to, I want to care for something, right? Those, those paternal uh, instincts are starting to come in, and, and I see Johnny with his kids, and, and I start to feel like that, that you know, that feeling. We, we work every day on our marriage knowing that the people we are today will impact the parents we will become tomorrow. And when we see kids and, and babies, we get that itch, you know? We start to feel the, the baby itch. And then we remember all the years we've been in children's ministry and youth ministry, and so we're waiting. We're also waiting between homes. We live in an apartment right now. I've lived in an apartment my whole life. And, and we have this dream to own a home one day, to own our own piece of property, our own land. Um, she's working on her degree right now. She's hoping to become a teacher. Pray for her. She's doing really great. She got A's this, this summer, and I'm so proud of her. And our plan right now is to save up as much as we can and one day to buy a home. But until then, we're waiting. Speaking personally, I'm a full-time youth pastor, and with the pandemic, my job has shifted in responsibilities. And right now, I'm, I'm helping more as the editor and producer of Adventure Kids Live. Just a little plug. It's a great show. I love the science part. Anyway, um, and I love doing that. I love editing. I love, I love working for the kids. And, and really, it's such a fun environment. But I also love working with the youth. I feel that I have a true calling working for, for the youth so until everything settles down and we approach normal again, I'm waiting. If I'm being honest, I think all of us are in a season of waiting right now. Every single one of us, everyone listening, everyone in the city, in the state, in this world right now, we're waiting. None of us know what the future holds. We don't know what, what's coming in the next few months. You know, the big conversation right now is what's going to happen with school. Right? Are we going back to school? Are we not, you know, masks on, mask off, whatever? You know, where are we? What are we doing? Right? Some of you have kids. You don't know whether to buy them masks and new clothing or to buy them a laptop and a desk or something like that. You know, for some of you, you're working in the education system. You have no idea what the next few months are holding, right? Uh, maybe you work in retail. Maybe you're a business owner. None of us. Not a single one of us knows what the future holds. As a state, as a nation, as a city, as a community of faith, all of us are in a waiting season. So today, church, I want to talk to you about waiting well. Beyond any current situation, I want us to remember that we are all, as Christians, as believers in Christ, waiting for the sin-shattering, world-remaking return of Jesus. That one day when Jesus comes back and everything melts in his presence and everything is made new again. But, but Jesus says, while he was here on earth in the book of Mark, chapter 13, 32 through 37, he, he says, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, or the conspiracy theorists. Not even the father, only the father, only the father knows when the end is coming. Be on guard though, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the, the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning. I always thought the rooster crowed at the morning. Anyway, Jesus ends with, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to you all, stay awake. 
Church, Jesus is telling us, don't waste your waiting. Waiting is a part of our spiritual DNA as Christians. We're people of waiting. Every song we sing, every verse we quote, all of it revolves around trusting God and waiting for him. Trusting that God will move, trusting that God will speak, trusting that God will shake or breathe or oceans or something like that. Like, like all of it revolves around trusting God and waiting in, the, in between. There's only one problem with that, though, if I'm being honest. I hate waiting. And I'm sure I'm not alone. I think we all kind of hate waiting. I hate waiting in line. I hate calling customer service. If you work in customer service, I love you. God bless you. I pray for you. But I hate customer service. I hate waiting in line to be told, no, I can't make a return. I hate waiting in line and being told, no, there's nothing wrong with your internet service. I, I, I hate being put on hold. Uh, I hate waiting a whole day for Amazon Prime. We're spoiled. It's okay. No one loves traffic. No one loves the robot on the other line telling you to hold for another 30 minutes. But the problems begin, church, when we don't wait well. We get angry. We get frustrated. Sometimes we end up yelling at people who are just waiting too. Road rage is a real thing. I know. I know a little too well. I'm glad we have masks now. <laughs> you probably won't recognize me on the road. My car's all beat up, so you probably will. Anyway, we get impatient and we allow our thoughts to spiral down. The, the, the thing that, that stinks about waiting is that you're just stuck with your thoughts. And if you don't have a healthy uh, pattern of, of thoughts, right? If you don't have healthy ways to think and to sort out your thoughts, you end up just spiraling down the negativity and, and you just, you get stuck. And all of a sudden, you're not waiting well, you're waiting wrong. You're becoming angry and angrier. Have you ever noticed that when you're waiting in traffic, what you do makes the biggest difference. If you're waiting there and it's hot, the AC's off, it doesn't work, the radio's messed up, and you're just stuck with all these people around you, you just get more frustrated. But, but when you wait, sometimes with a cool AC, the music is soft, you're listening to some worship, all of a sudden you're, you're in God's presence and you're like, I'm going to take advantage of this time. And then the light turns green and you're like, dang it, <laughs> I'll just get in there. You see, there's a difference between waiting well and waiting wrong. When, when Jesus was speaking about stay awake, I, I read that scripture and I think, Jesus, well, I'm awake, you know, I'm, I'm here. But, but maybe he wasn't speaking about physically sleeping church. Maybe he was speaking about spiritually forgetting who we are in Christ. Maybe when Jesus says, church, you need to stay awake because one day I'm coming back. He's not saying physically stay awake. I'm sure that's a part of it. But I think more than anything else, he's saying be focused and attentive. Be prepared. Be ready. Don't forget who I've called you to be. I remember when I was younger, uh, I was probably around eight years old. And it was around November. Christmas is right around the corner. Toys R Us is blasting commercials. This was back in the day when you got these Toys R Us ads in the mail and it was just full of toys and bright colors. It was just eye candy for kids. And the Nintendo 64 was just coming out. 3D graphics, oh my gosh, right? Like, like the, the most amazing thing a kid could ever see. And as a kid, depending if you ask my parents, a good kid, I, I went snooping into my parents' room looking for presents. Because I couldn't hold it. I just couldn't wait. And lo and behold, I scavenge through the room, under their bed, behind the, their, their drawers. And, and I find these boxes in a Toys R Us bag or something. And I open the bag. I take out this gift wrap box. And, and almost like I was in a James Bond film or Mission Impossible, I slowly start to unwrap the box. And I see, I see God's blessing on earth. The Nintendo 64. I've never been that happy again in my life. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. 
My wife's going to be mad. No, I'm joking. But but the the joy I had was so crazy because, uh, you know, I found this secret. I found this console. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And I kept the secret. I somehow wrapped it back closed. And, and you know, no one's ever going to know. And I put it back away. And, and I waited till Christmas. I didn't say anything. I didn't tell my brother. I didn't tell anyone. And then Christmas Day comes. My parents go to their room. They got that look in their eye like, I'm about to blow your mind. They go to their room. They come with a bag. And as they open the bag you see this box with torn gift wrap paper, tape. It's a di totally different tape, right? Like it was a clear tape they used. This one was like duct tape or something like that. Like terrible. And I could see the look on their face as I tried to act surprised. I don't know if you have kids, but children normally are terrible actors. If your children are not terrible actors, we need them here. Please bring them. We can always take more actors. But, but they could tell. They knew that I knew. And as funny as that story is and as silly as it is, I was reflecting on this because I remember that I ruined the surprise for myself. But I also ruined the surprise for them. I, I looked up, a, did a little bit of digging. I looked up the price of a Nintendo 64 adjusted for inflation for today. My parents had paid almost $500 to bring joy to my brother and I. We weren't even straight-A students. <laughs> Come on. That's love. They, they had worked hard to save that money to bless their kids. And the only thing that parents get in return for these gifts are the look on their kids' faces, the joy on their children. And, and in some ways, I took that away from my parents. And so as, I, I, as I'm preaching on waiting, and I hear this story and I write this story, I think about our Father God. About how he paid the price of his son to gift us with salvation from judgment, forgiveness of sins, and the gift of new life. There's a bit of a process, right? That gift of new life is unwrapped slowly. And it takes time. But his greatest joy is to see his children experience that gift of new life in fullness. The way he intended it to. The way he is gifted. And we, as spoiled children sometimes, don't like to wait. We get impatient. We want to experience life to its fullest now. We want pleasure now. We want happiness now. You see, sir, you see, church, sometimes we want to skip the waiting because we see it more as a problem and less of a process. <sighs> waiting well determines if it was worth the wait. And waiting on God is always worth the wait. So let's talk today about waiting well. I want to give you three biblical characters. I want to examine three biblical characters how they've waited, and how that waiting impacted the world. First, let's talk about Mary, right? Mary's an interesting character because Mary, when she's introduced into the, into the, the story of the Bible, she's a 14-year-old girl who has an angel show up to her and says, hey, Mary, you're going to get pregnant with the Savior of the world. What? What? I have no idea what it's like to go through something like that. I have no idea what it's like to experience that kind of anxiety, stress, confusion. I have no idea what it's like to explain to her fiancé what she saw, what had happened, and who she was carrying. It was so unbelievable that God had to send an, a literal angel to explain it to him. And yet all Mary could do was wait. The book of Luke describes a 14-year-old girl who has come to terms with her situation. I can't come to terms with quarantine right now. And, and yet Mary is coming to terms with being, born, with, with being pregnant with the Savior of the world. God give us that kind of grace. But Luke says that she comes to terms 
with her situation. And instead of giving in to despair or fear or doubt, she turns her eyes to the Lord and sings a song. And so Luke chapter 1, verse 46 through 55 says this. And Mary sang, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. I receive that. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in thought of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has fulfilled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. You see, church, Mary waited well because Mary was waiting with joy. In the middle of this pandemic, I want to wait with joy. Not with bitterness or confusion because of the situation. I want to wait in joy, overflowing from my trust in the Savior. Joy is produced when we trust God with our past, our future, and we find peace in the now. I'm going to say that one more time. Joy is produced when we trust the Lord with our past, our future, and find peace in the now. Some of us are thinking, I should have done other things in the past, or I can't believe what's going to happen in the future. And instead of worrying about those things that you can no longer control, we need to trust God with those things and trust him with the now and have peace in that. You're struggling to find joy because you're distracted. You're not seeing the things that God is doing in the now. You're distracted because you're not seeing the peace he's bringing to you now. Joy is produced when we trust the Lord. Period. You will never know true joy until you trust the Lord with your life. Next, I want to speak about Jesus. I want to talk to you about how Jesus waited. In Luke chapter 22, the Bible speaks about the day before Jesus' crucifixion. The day before he is put on a cross. The chapter goes over that he had just gone through his last supper. Judas has just betrayed him. And the, the interrogators and the soldiers are on their way to arrest him. He knew what was coming. He knew what was waiting for him. He knew that ahead of him lied the most difficult sacrifice ever made by a man. He knew that in hours he would be tortured, beat, and bear the sins of mankind upon himself. And so scripture says that he went up to the Mount of Olives that night to pray. And in Luke chapter 23, 22, 39 through 43, it says that he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter in temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. I think it's safe to say that Jesus is stressed out. Jesus is in agony of what he's about to encounter, what he's about to go through. You see, church, Jesus was waiting 
to die on a cross. Jesus was waiting to suffer. But the difference is that Jesus waited well. Why? Because Jesus was waiting with obedience. Was it going to hurt? Yes. Was this going to be hard? Yes. But church, was it worth it? Yes. I remember when there were days at the beginning of this quarantine that I was asking God, just put me to sleep and wake me up when all this ends. My first time going to HUB after the quarantine had started, I didn't want to be nice. I had just been ordained a few weeks before the quarantine hit. And I'm just thinking, I don't want anyone to know I'm a pastor while I go to HUB because I want to throw down. Like people are getting too close to me. I'm like in the frozen food section. I'm trying to pick food in peace and people are like hovering around me. I'm like, don't you know there are people dying outside and you're here? Like in my mind, it was like the apocalypse. I've watched enough zombie shows to know where this was going. And then I'd see people online not quarantining. I'm praying for you. I had to delete so many text messages that I was going to send, but didn't. Church, I want to wait with obedience. Because I don't always want to be obedient. But I want to wait with obedience because God knows better. I do not. And that has been proven time and time again. And I'm sure that's been proven in your life too. That when we wait with obedience, we get to see God do things in our lives that were never possible But when we wait under our own strength, under our own patience, well, you know how that goes. I want to wait with obedience, knowing that God knows better. I do not. I want to get into fights at HEB. God wants me to pray for people that are passing me at HEB. Come on. Some days I log into Facebook and I see the COVID updates and I really want to stay home. But I know that God wants us to see revival, church. I know that even in these days, even in these times, God wants to see revival like never before, even in the pandemic. But you see, here's the thing. Obedience to his father allowed Jesus to accomplish the impossible. Do you want to see the impossible in your life? Do you want to see the impossible in your family's life? Do you want to see the impossible happen today and now? Well, then we need to be obedient in the waiting. And finally, I want to talk to you about Paul. Paul the apostle. You see, Paul's my kind of guy. I like Paul. See, Paul went from being a terrorist to the writer of the New Testament. Real quick. He meets Jesus once and it's like, you know what? You're right. I am a bad guy. I do need you. Let's do it, right? Paul then spends about 30 years of his life until death preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, giving his life to the mission of Jesus. And his final letter to the church, the book of Romans, he writes, Like I said, after proclaiming the good news for 30 years, I'm 32. Paul spent my entire life preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. I haven't been doing anything my entire life that long consistently. But he's preaching the good news everywhere he gets a chance. He's been beaten, whipped, hunted down, arrested, shipwrecked. And Paul knew that every single time he went to a new city to proclaim the news, every time he went to a new tabernacle or synagogue to preach the good news, that it could be his absolute last time. That people were hunting him down, that people wanted him dead, that every time he preached the good news, the devil was looking for him. And every time Paul preached, he knew he might one day meet his maker. Paul knew that he was waiting to meet his creator. And he was going to do that one day. But in the meanwhile, he writes in Romans 8, verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Church, these moments do not compare to what God has in store for us. Not just in this lifetime, but in eternity. 
Paul is waiting with purpose. He knows that one day he's going to see God's glory face to face. He knows, he trusts, he has absolute confidence. And so he lives like it. He knows that one day all his current sufferings will melt in God's glory. But until that day comes, Paul is waiting with purpose. See, this life is waiting. It's a waiting period. All of us are going to be in God's glory one day. All of us are going to face him one day. And this moment, this life we have, this limited time is a waiting period. The question is, what purpose have you given your life? What purpose have you allowed your life to take on? Paul says, my purpose in life is to magnify God. Less of me and more of him. And so he lives every day with every drop of sweat and every ounce of energy devoted to something, someone, Jesus. Paul was waiting on purpose. Paul was waiting with purpose. And so that made Paul's waiting powerful. Church, purpose, let me say that again. Church, Purpose makes waiting become powerful. I want every second I wait for God to be a reflection of my love for God. I want every second that I wait for his promises to be a reflection of my trust in the promiser. I want to wait well because Jesus is coming soon. I don't know when he's coming. I don't know if I'll see him come. But I know one thing for sure is that he's on his way and I want to live like he's already here. And so church, I want to invite you. I want to challenge you. Let's wait well together until that day comes that we stand face to face in glory with the creator. Let's wait well. Let's wait with joy. Let's wait with obedience. Let's wait with purpose knowing that he's on the way. Before we end, I want to acknowledge something. I know that waiting has become harder and harder every day with all the news that we stream into our heads. At one point, I had about five or six different apps all dedicated to the news and some weren't even from this country. All I wanted to know was where was this situation going? Where's COVID going? Where is, where's the pandemic? How's Australia doing? How's, you know, France doing? How's the United States doing? How's Canada doing? Mexico and all these countries, how are they doing? And I, I was fixated, obsessed with the pandemic. And it made it waiting harder. Every day was difficult. Every day just meshed into itself. Uh, there were points in the, in the deep quarantine where I forgot what day it was. A summer in hell. And it was terrible. It was so difficult. And I'm sure you guys went through similar situations. And so it, it becomes harder, especially with these news, with all the news that we pump into our minds and all the news that we're just so obsessed with. But I want to tell you something, church, that the good news of Jesus Christ is still good. And it's only, and just to make sure that you know, it's the only news that still matters. Because the current news that you see on CNN or Fox or whatever your, your addiction is, the only news that will stay, that will last, that has never changed is the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's it. Because the news will change. COVID will go. COVID will be gone. And we'll be on to another thing and another thing and more drama and more wars and all these other things. But the good news of Jesus Christ has withstood every single empire, every single dictator, every, every single person that has tried to take it down. And it is still good. And the best news is that it's still for you and me. And so wherever you are right now, whoever you are right now, the good news, if you haven't heard it, is that even though we are still sinners undeserving, God in his infinite love sent his only son to die on a cross for us. And that through that sacrifice, all those who come to him, place their trust in him, put their faith in him, believe in him, are freed from sin, are freed from judgment, and are made new in his image 
and given new life. Scripture says that we are saved, sealed, and resurrected into Jesus. And the only thing, church, the only thing that he asks is that we trust him and that we wait. And so if you're hearing this for this first time, or maybe you've heard this a thousand times before, but something is shaking differently this time. Something is poking your heart differently this time. I want to invite you to take the first step in knowing that truth. I want to invite you into the first step of knowing Jesus deeply and truly. And so I would ask that you would pray with me right now. Wherever you're at, just close your eyes and bow your head and and just pray with me. Jesus, I pray that you would be with me right now. I recognize my need for you. I recognize my need for a savior that I cannot save myself and that Jesus, you are mighty to save. Jesus, I need you. And I pray that you would save me right now, that you would forgive my sins. Jesus, I trust that you are mighty to save. Jesus, I trust that my sins are forgiven in your blood, that Jesus, my sins are washed away in your grace. And now, Jesus, I belong to you. I pray that you would change me every day more and more into your image. I pray that you would transform me from the inside out. And I pray that you would transform my purpose in life to worship you and to magnify you in all the world. In your name, Jesus, the only name that saves. Amen. Church, thank you for being with us today. We love you. We pray that we could all work and wait well together. Go in peace. Go in love. Go in victory. This is the end of our teaching. For more information, visit thecrossroads.org, download our app, or visit any of our social media platforms. Thank you for watching.